I said to host, tell him we will not retreat from our positions. Tell them if we don't settle it tonight, it might never get settled. We agreed that the crossing points be jointly controlled. It was five o'clock in the morning. After seven hours on the telephone, they finally had an agreement. I think the phone bill was paid by the Swedish government. We still owe them the money. President Clinton agreed to host a signing ceremony. Then, with everyone gathering in Washington and on their way to the White House, Yasser Arafat noticed something missing from the document, the name PLO. He said, I cannot sign this document. I'm the chairman of the PLO, not the head of the Palestinian delegation. And Israel has recognized the PLO. So what are the Israelis up to? Sort it out. Ahmed Tibi rang me. He said, there's a small matter to be sorted out. If it isn't sorted out, the ceremony is off and the chairman is going home. I saw Arafat ordering the plane to be, to, to be ready to leave Washington if they don't accept the PLO. I said, listen, all the documents are printed and ready. It's just an hour before the signing. Less than half an hour before the signing ceremony, Peres called Arafat's representative to his hotel. He suggested that the phrase, the PLO team, be added to the document. I said, I'll ring Arafat. I said to Arafat, Perez says, how about the PLO team? Arafat said, in all of the text? I said, in all the text. He said, okay, two kisses, one for you and one for Perez. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arafat, chairman of the executive council of the Palestine Liberation Organization, his Excellency Yitzhak Rabin, Prime Minister of Israel, the President of the United States. The moment I saw Arafat walking out from the White House <laughs> with Rabin next to him and Clinton and so on, imagine this White House that said bye-bye to the PLO, that branded Arafat as a terrorist, Rabin, the chief of staff who occupied the West Bank and Jerusalem, and uh, it was electrifying. Rabin didn't want to look at Arafat. It was terrible. The whole world is watching his body language and he keeps moving his head not to look at Arafat. And I did not think that they would shake hands. He hesitated a little bit, but I insisted and I continued stretching my hand to him. And then the way President Clinton pulled it it was evident that wasn't planned. Arafat just wouldn't let go of his hand. He's a great expert at such things. It was a, a moment that be recalled as long as we live, I think. After he finished shaking his hands, Rabin turned to me. He whispered, now it's your turn. He went through this hell. Now it was my turn. But the agreement did not bring peace. In the occupied territories, a large number of Palestinians vowed to continue the fight. In Israel, too, the opposition was fierce. We think that this endangers Israel, and what I would do as Prime Minister is to do anything responsible uh, within the rule of law 
to stop and nullify the dangers that emanate from this agreement with the PLO to Israel's security. What Arafat led now was not quite a state, but for the first time in history, the Palestinians had a government of their own. Among the Arab countries, now Jordan would join Egypt in making a deal with the Israelis. King Hussein was at last able to sign the peace treaty he had wanted. What we have accomplished and what we are committed to is the end of the state of war between Jordan and Israel. But between Syria and Israel, the state of war continued. In an effort to broaden the Middle East peace, President Clinton came to Damascus. President Clinton told President Assad that, well, Rabin presented to you full withdrawal to the line of 4 June, and we expect from you two now to move the next step. Clinton pressed Assad to send his top military commander to meet his Israeli counterpart and work out the practicalities of ending their state of war. It was a big decision for Syria to send our chief of staff for the first time in history to meet the Israeli chief of staff. It's a very heavy and big decision. Assad held back. First, he wanted his ambassador to Washington to meet the Israeli chief of staff. We wore wigs so that we wouldn't be recognized in the El Al flight. We arrived at the meeting place in Washington. Only then could we breathe freely. Take off our wigs. I took a last look at myself in the mirror. Whenever I wear a wig, I look like my mother. The Israeli commander began the meeting by speaking of a military withdrawal without specifying the precise frontier. I insisted that withdrawal has to be to the line of 4 June 1967. I repeat this word more than 20 times during the talk with Barak. Like a parrot, he repeated their demand to withdraw to the June 4th border. The Israeli wanted a more informal exchange. During breaks, we walked in the garden. There, we were off the record. And we uh, spoke, frankly, whether they are committed to settlement with Syria or not, whether they understand what it re requires. On the patio, there were these arched doorways. I compared peace between us to the keystone of the arch. At the end, you feel that he wants to make it. He wants to find a solution. He wants to give his blessing. This encouraging start led Assad to send his chief of staff to join the talks. They discussed military safeguards, for example, the future of Israel's early warning station in the Golan. Talks progressed in fits and starts. On the night Syria and Israel agreed to begin a new round of talks, the Israeli peacemakers held a rally in Tel Aviv. We sang, the three of us, the singer Miri Aloni, Yitzhak and myself. Yitzhak and I are not such great singers. He had the words of the peace song on a sheet of paper. After we sang, out of tune, Yitzhak folded it and put it in the pocket of his jacket. On the way to his car, he was shot dead by an Israeli extremist. 